21 Lessons for the 21st Century by Yuval Noah Harari. This book here is written by a historian in order to offer some clarity into the debate of the future of mankind. Something I have been thinking about and learning about for years. He says that thinking about the bigger picture is a relatively rare luxury. What's great about this book is that it's not some narrative. It's just a, it's a full collection of lessons. Some of them about technology, some on politics, some on religion, some on art. What does the rise of Trump signify? What can we do about the epidemic of fake news? This dude is really smart. It is no wonder why Mark Zuckerberg made sure to have a 97 minute conversation with him about things like whether the internet is connecting or fragmenting society, the different ways artificial intelligence could be developed, how algorithms will continue to impact people's lives, and why it's so important that we don't store sensitive data in countries with weak rule of law, or where governments can forcibly access it. The depth of his writing reminds me a little bit of Nassim Nicholas Taleb's. If you value this book, he says at the end of the intro, you should value the freedom of expression. And I found that interesting. Each lesson is like a word, basically. I'm gonna try to review each lesson as briefly as I can, because dude, there are 21 of them. Lesson one is disillusionment. Disillusionment is a word that, like, I don't remember the last time I heard before checking out this book. And I had to look it up. A feeling of disappointment resulting from the discovery that something is not as good as one believed it to be. So he talks a little about the recent turmoil of liberal democracy in the last several decades and how it has been hit by the rise of artificial intelligence. Engineers, entrepreneurs, and scientists don't know the political implications of their endeavors. And technological disruption is not even an item on today's political agenda. The main thing with disillusionment is that people have lost faith in old stories that we have been telling ourselves and the reasons we have lost faith are beginning to outpace our ability to keep coming up with new ones. Lesson two is work. Something lots of Americans love and lots of Americans hate. And lots of Americans pretend to love but really kind of just hate. <laughs> he talks about something lots of people have been worrying about for a while. Breakthroughs in tech, life, and even social sciences and they're leading to a potentially volcanic impact on the global job market. AKA the threat of like massive job loss in the next few decades. But actually happening. If this worried you, I super super highly recommend checking out Life 3.0 by Max Tegmark. These lessons aren't like you know, brush your teeth and eat your vegetables here. This is like huge potential problems, but I want to inform you of its implications in a way as balanced and kind of like, here are the facts, so let's do what we can as possible. In order to cope with the unprecedented models of the 21st century, we need to develop new ones as soon as possible. Ones that involve the well-being and fundamental rights of humans like privacy and universal basic income. Lesson three is liberty. Liberalism encourages free market principles at its core. It's funny, this isn't even the political section of the book. He says we are all equally free in terms of free will, but at the same time, voting is based on feelings and not logic. Mark Zuckerberg in their talk from April mentioned something that makes Harari unique as a historian is his interest in and ability to very comfortably talk about the future. Michio Kaku or Kaku or Keiko, Ko, I, I, Koko, the gorilla, I don't know. <laughs> he has a lecture on YouTube talking about how the world will be different in 2030. This book talks about how different the world will be in 2050. In lesson three, he talks about the ethical problems and discussions that are being and will be faced by the creators and collectors of big data. I think it's important to know these things so you can more usefully analyze the effectiveness of the layouts of their strategies to handle them as time passes. He explains the differences between consciousness and intelligence. One involves feelings and the other involves problem solving. Lesson four is equality. Because those who own the data own the future. And like Facebook proposes and Apple, I imagine, would agree with, the future is private. He highlights the benefit of hierarchical societies, households, and the like, only to go on to say not only do the richest 1% own half the world's wealth, but the richest 100 people own more than the poorest 4 billion. And he explains how this could get far, far worse, almost to an irreversible degree, because the premises and backgrounds of the super rich in the last century, like the Rockefellers and Carnegies, have shapeshifted their ways 
into the premises and backgrounds of the super rich today, like the Zuckerbergs and the Bezoses. Among other reasons, he asks, how do you regulate the ownership of data? And proposes that this may very well be like the most important question of our era. That's all part one of five. It's called the technological challenge. Part two is called the political challenge. Lesson five is community. All about everything surrounding the conflict of global cooperation for the collective benefit of humankind. Lesson six is civilization, where he talks about how religions have changed their perspectives of ancient text. He talks about the benefits of war and how it connects countries together in times of struggle to strengthen the bonds of them. I mean, I like books like this because I never consider things like this. For so long, I always looked at war like it is literally good for absolutely nothing. But even things like war have their pros, and books like this tell me about those things. So it helps me look a little bit more divergently at you know, different things in the world and life. You know, kind of open my mind a little. He talks about the Olympics and how they've changed over the years. Lesson seven is nationalism, where he explains the benefits of patriotism and a little on nationalism. He talks about climate change and the meat industry and how they're affected by it and how biotech alone can seriously disrupt the meat industry. Lesson eight is religion, talking about the victory of science versus the quantity and quality of religion's power across the world of yesterday, today, and tomorrow. By the way, I feel like, you know, this review so far, I've been kind of just explaining what he's talked about, but all of these things, he gives really, really specific examples and maybe hypotheticals across, like, a majority of the countries in the world. At some point in this chapter, he says something I found interesting is the true expertise of priests and gurus have never been rain-making or healing or prophecy or magic. Rather, it has always been interpretation and justification. He says the world will always need religion so long as it needs a mass cooperation of some kind, especially when that mass cooperation itself involves a belief in something within and beyond just oneself. Lesson 9 is immigration. I feel like he looks so divergently yet realistically at these subjects that it's hard to ultimately disagree with him. Like, not much of this book is even, like, his opinion. And if it is, his opinion itself has become so understanding of other people's that it seems like it really can't hurt at all to hear it out. Racism seems to be a big thing pertaining to the conversations of immigration, but apparently racism, most of the time, isn't really racism. What most people think is racist is really actually just culturist. It is a phenomenal proposal he drops into the book. And to say that just because it's culturist doesn't mean it's as bad, I don't, I think it still fucking sucks. I think it's a bad thing regardless. As well as, of course, the whole immigration synopsis and all the different viewpoints, like how they're correct, how they're wrong, and, you know, of course, how they're not exactly perfect. But some things we can all do to sort of move them in the right direction for us. Lesson 10 is terrorism, which honestly sounds a lot more, like, psychological than violent. This uh, is one of the most interesting, like, illuminating things I heard about in the book. Because it's one of those, you know, under-the-nose things, and it's like, you know, you haven't looked there. There, but you looked everywhere else. There's something he used to compare the act of 9-11 to how a fly, yes, a fly, successfully destroyed a china shop. We have a tendency to think things like this mainly because of the whole, you know, if it bleeds, it leads scenario that many media channels like to utilize to grab more of our attention and money. Even if you talk about disease or something, apparently terrorism is more important to people. So honestly, if we stop reacting, <laughs> as strongly as we do, the media channels can't effectively, like, even broadcast it. If you want to look at it like a now or never type of thing, either we have to stop or they have to stop. Because if one happens, the other will happen. Terrorists know that if something like 9-11 has happened, now if they kill, like, seven people in a church or something, everybody is gonna fucking freak out! The fear of terrorism in the US is way, way greater than I thought. However, the fear is far worse than the terrorism itself. I really didn't even know that terrorism wasn't even that bad. But if you, like I did, think that terrorism is bad, I recommend checking out the book where he shows us that thoughts really are the amplification of terrorism and how it's far more of a mental danger than a physical danger. And also how specifically the terrorism of today is nothing compared to what it was at other points and places in history. A lot of things in this book are about how times have changed. Of course, with the exceptions of things like 
technological disruption and economic inequality and environmental issues, and really anything with an outcome that's ultimately determined by the collective hive mind of the general public and what direction it wants to go in, the world seems to be moving in a good direction as the years, decades, centuries, and millennia sort of fly by. Yet as the warfare and many other problems become more psychological, many of us tend to forget about today in comparison to earlier ones when it was so, so, so much worse in areas like terrorism and racism and war. Lesson 11, speaking of which, is war. He talks about how Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has improved its geographical position by not participating in war. Same thing with Putin and Russia. It seems like the most powerful forces are intangible. Yet Harari says it's extremely dangerous to assume that the next world war is inevitable, which I found interesting. Like, how is that dangerous? At the same time, he says, one, human stupidity is not to be underestimated, and two, it's naive to assume that war is impossible. Lesson 12 is humility. It's weird because he starts by by talking about the humility of like full nations and like the pride that people attach themselves to you know being part of the nations they will swear one or more of their own people of historic like historic value have invented this or that they or i guess we because i'm american and as a country we are um i'll put it this way a lot of other countries know about us <laughs> Actually, you know what? Maybe that's not true. Maybe I need some more humility in my life. Since if you've seen my insight videos, I suppose that whatever cockiness I bring to the table and maybe even self-deprecating humor is not enough for my viewers. But if you break it down, like fundamentally, the discoveries and inventions and everything have nothing to do with the origin of the person who did it. In comparison, of course, to the intangible forces that are responsible for it, which have been around probably longer than humans. Perhaps humans just happen to grasp them along the way. By these I'm talking about things like, you know, creativity, resourcefulness, curiosity, persistence, courage, faith, and a lot of other things. Whoever invented those in my humble opinion has the supreme bragging rights. He makes a very sarcastic remark on what's been said by many of the people to which he and even myself belong. The Jews. He tells a story about how a yoga instructor of his in Israel first explained that Avraham, or Abraham, and all the Hebrew letters are actually shaped after yoga poses, and or vice versa. Then he goes on to say the following, which is really down the alley of objective, you know, I'm just looking from really far away type humor. Another non- fiction writer like Nassim Taleb would display in his works, just not about Jews, I don't think he's Jewish. Mainstream Judaism solemnly maintains that the entire cosmos exists just so that Jewish rabbis can study their holy scriptures, and that if Jews cease this practice, the universe will come to an end. China, India, Austria, and even the distant galaxies will all be annihilated if the rabbis in Jerusalem and Brooklyn stop debating the Talmud. He then goes on this ridiculous rant. I mean, ridiculous in a good way. Like, this part of the book really put his sense of humor under a spotlight and in front of a microphone for this rant about our people, the Jews or his of Israel, and how Judaism and its history are really, like, not a big deal at all in the whole of humanity's timeline. He's like, yeah, I mean, Jews, well, we think we're all that, but we're really not. But the reason he even does that in the first place is to suggest to the reader or listener the same. Like, think about your people. All people are not all that great. He says lots of anti-Semites have argued that we own the banks and the media and lots of other things. But this is really just as crazy as saying that we're hot shit. Lesson 13 is God. Lots of things can be said about the contradictions between exactly what he wants and says and exactly what he likes, exactly who he's the God of, and exactly who he wants them to punish. Harari talks about the intensity and insanity and the level-headedness of different perspectives surrounding this God. Lesson 14 is secularism. This one focuses on the benefits of, you know, understanding the differences between belief and truth. He stresses the cost of only accepting one set of beliefs and answers and how bio and nanotechnology will require us to come up with new answers to new questions anyway. Lesson 15 is ignorance. Apparently we have come to rely on each other's know-how so heavily that we have come to know less and less about things as time passes. This is also definitely something Nassim Nicholas Taleb would talk about in his books. And also, as a matter of fact, 
Lots of his book, Black Swan, is based on this notion, what he calls anti-knowledge. The more we know, the more we begin to realize we don't. And the more we think we know, the more we don't realize that we don't. Lesson 16 is justice. Lots of people will put blame on each other without knowing who's really to blame. This has increasingly come to my attention. If you are watching this, it may begin to do the same to you if you end up getting this book. Like, how is it possible to avoid stealing when the global economic structure is endlessly stealing on your behalf without your knowledge. Lesson 17 is post-truth. So much of what we talk about today is actually not even true because of how much it's beginning to change. He talks a lot about fake news in this one and the previous one or two. Lesson 18 is science fiction where he talks about a concoction of things like the movies The Matrix and Inside Out saying that the external world is really kind of a macrocosm of the internal world. Lesson 19 is education and probably my favorite. The progression of education around the world is something I'm very passionate about as someone who would do badly in school itself my whole life whether I tried or not I just don't learn the way schools have expected kids of today to even know how he advises the kids of today not to listen to the adults of today all the time since the wisdom so many adults think is timeless is beginning to age while things that they attract the wisdom from are beginning to change more rapidly sometimes I tell people that I worry about the world at the end of this chapter Harari explains one of my best reasons clear as day. It's about knowing yourself before it's too late. One of the deepest reasons I do what I do and maybe even why you're watching this video. But if you want to know more, well, that's also in the book. Lesson 20 is meaning. He says that humans think in stories, which I find interesting. I really do live for chapters like this one. If everyone spent their lives aiming to know themselves and search for meaning, do you see the world becoming worse or better? Lesson 21 is meditation. Not what I was expecting. I mean, what would you put after meaning? But meditation is really important if you know a thing or two about it. This guy does. He talks about Vipassana retreats and what the learning curve was like saying that when you really try it, you begin to realize how impatient the mind is. Like Eckhart Tolle says in his book, The Power of Now, my third favorite book of all time, he says that thinking is a disease. I mean, this is kind of true if you look into it. If you ask anyone, especially in America, about their experience with meditation, a lot of people who I've asked have told me that they don't have the patience or the discipline or it's too difficult. I really do have to push myself in order to not push myself at times of my life during which meditation is like a daily thing. But what's so difficult <laughs> about it if you really just have to sit and breathe? It's so simple, is it not? Well, he talks about that in the book as well. Quotes, history does not give discounts. Philosophers are very patient people, but engineers are far less so. And investors are the least patient of all. Humans were always better at inventing tools than using them wisely. Democracy is the worst political system in the world, except for all the others. Questions you cannot answer are usually far better for you than answers you cannot question. It is only against the backdrop of the universe that I can know who I am. A story that ignores the whole of time, the whole of space, the Big Bang, quantum physics, and the evolution of life is at most just a tiny part of the truth. Some neurons adjust not on speaking terms with one another. Take away human feelings and you are left with a bunch of molecules. Direction 1. I recommend this book if you are very curious about the past and future of the world, and especially the present. I also recommend this book if you are a big thinker and you like to look at the bigger picture of life. I think sometimes we forget that what we see and hear about isn't really all there is, you know what I mean? Like you can only take so much input on what's happening in the world in real time. So I think this book really answers the questions many of us have regarding the bigger picture. I also recommend this book if you're like me and you worry about the world as well as where it's heading. Direction 2. If you like this book, I recommend The Inevitable by Kevin Kelly. I think Kelly is more of an insider to the fields of technology and artificial intelligence. And if you want to know where the future really is in a way that's even more concrete and in-depth than what's described in this book, that book is worth checking out for sure. I also recommend Life 3.0 by Max Tegmark, especially if you are scared of artificial intelligence and where it's headed. You know, the idea of robots taking over the world. I don't know who's not 
not scared of robots taking over the world. I also recommend checking out Black Swan by Nassim Taleb, one of my favorite books I listened to toward the end of 2018. It's about the impact and probabilities of super, super extreme events like 9-11 or Google and how people tend to look for simple explanations to the events. It explains a lot of things that people say without knowing how flawed and wrong those things are. 21 Lessons for the 21st Century by Yuval Noah Harari. There's a link to it in the description if you guys want to check it out and read the reviews. That and all the other books I mentioned in this video if you want to check those out too. If there are any other books that you guys wanted me to check out and review, please let me know in the comments below. If you checked out this book, what did you think? Did you like it? I want to spark some dialogue down in the comments and get to know my audience. But hey, make sure to leave a like if you like this video, subscribe if you haven't already. If you could turn on that little bell to receive a notification every time I drop a new video, that would mean the world to me. Thank you guys so much for watching. You can find me everywhere and I will see you then.